Hello and welcome to another episode of JEHC. Tonight we are going to be continuing our discussion um, on independent front suspension design for the off-road industry. Primarily focused on like the truck side of things, um, center mount, long travel type setups. And we left off last time after we went through a bunch of definitions and some sort of guidelines to starting the design process, like kind of what we roughly do here at uh, Tech Consulting. And we are now going to be starting today with some review um, on some of that. We're going to go into inclination and scrub. We're going to go into some camber curve stuff, caster curve stuff. Um, we're also going to talk about rake. And we'll see how far we can get tonight. I think that's a good good chunk of topics to cover. My name is Jason Elbus Hurd. I am um, founder of Tech Consulting Inc. So we do design development for things uh, just like this, um, day in and day out. I also own DIYoffroad.com, digital asset marketplace for designers like myself to sell our digital assets to you, the people, um, to cut and build whatever the hell you want. Like, let's just pick something, for example. Here's something relatively new and pretty cool. This is a plasma table friendly I-beam front bulkhead assembly. So what this is, is a uh, complete bulkhead that um, encompasses our fabricated I-beams, center mount radius arms, swinger steering, and all that good stuff. Um, and all the geometry is done and set up, and you can graph this onto the front of your truck. Um, and it includes the beam, it includes the cut files for the beams, the radius arms, all this bits right here. And so uh, we sell the you know cut files for this. So I know this is a shameless plug to start this off, but I don't have any sponsors. Um, I am self-sponsored. So basically everything um, we do between uh, Tech Consulting and DIY Off-Road and soon to be DIY Muscle Car um, is what supports all the, the bullshit and, and like this uh, horribly inept podcast. We have a cool studio though, and I'm starting to figure out the sound stuff pretty good. I'm starting to figure out the lighting stuff better, a little bit better. Um, but, uh, we definitely, uh, spend most of our time behind the computer doing design work all day long, every day for a variety of clients. Um, like on the screen here, you see like a formula drift type uh, project that we did. That's a tube chassis, Nissan for Nissan and Valvoline, uh, for Chris Forsberg's, Chris Forsberg's uh, deal. In fact, I think we're going to film an episode on that. We did one on DeBerti's truck, um, which was, uh. That truck right there, um, this truck right here, uh, we did that, an episode on that tube chassis and went in detail on that stuff. But, um, you know, so this is what I do uh, day in and day out um, as my day job. And so, long story short, this is the second volume of the independent front suspension uh, design session. And uh, we're going to be reviewing uh, some of the uh, bits we left off last time. Um, so I did a bunch of definitions on the first uh, volume of this. I am only on, let's see, page, I'm only two and a half pages into a 13 page, um, 14 page roughly outline. And uh, let's jump right in. So first and foremost, let's see. Oh, that's the old tech robotic solutions one. That's funny. Um, tech consulting. So let's, uh, let's discuss some bits on long travel wheelbase track whisk, and then some of the center mount wheelbase and track whisk. Okay. So for long travel trucks, um, which we described earlier is applications where you have like a stock frame rail, stock cab, things along those lines. So these are the majority of the trucks you'll see that, you know, like you're building that are, you know, um, ground and pound street type of vehicles, that uh, guys are either building themselves or having shops built. Some of the companies that do long travel-esque stuff that come to mind is Blitzky Graf Road, obviously Kib Tech, Missoula is a pretty famous one for Silverados. You also have Camberg Engineering. HM makes stuff for like uh, Ford Raptors. Izzy Fab does stuff for Silverados as well. I feel like I am completely fucking forgetting um, stuff. There's several other companies that do Raptor stuff um, as well, other than HM. Um, but basically it's, you know, stock, uh, platforms that, uh, have a chassis that is mostly stock. Sometimes we will do different upper arm mounts. Um, 
Yeah, and sometimes we will uh, finagle other stuff. But let's focus on wheelbase track with sort of generalities and characteristics in long travel setups. So when it comes to a long travel truck, one of the primary things you have to start with is wheel and tire package that you prefer. So let's take like a standard Silverado long travel setup, for example. A lot of the guys these days do want to try and run a 40-inch tire. Now, for obvious reasons, that's going to cause some problems relative to the firewall clearance as well as the front radiator and core support clearance and headlight assembly. So you do have some mitigation that you can uh, deploy in this um, you know, design of long travel stuff for, say, like a Silverado. Let's use the Silverado as our example for now. What I can do when designing that stuff for a client that wants to fit a 40 is I can take that entire upright assembly relative to where it is stock location in space on the chassis and scoot it forward in the chassis. So we are in essence gaining wheelbase intentionally by pushing the front excuse me, front wheelbase forward to gain some tire clearance on the firewall. Now, even with 40s, you're still going to have to trim the firewall, etc. And and I get it. You're probably some of you might be thinking like, well, that's bullshit. You just said push it forward. Well, just like everything in off-road, just like everything suspension-wise, you can't just willy-nilly fucking throw shit into one direction without causing a cascade of other things starting to either get cattywampus or fucked up. So with that said, you can gain an inch, inch and a half, two inches of wheelbase in something like a Silverado without too much um, starting to rear its ugly head in other aspects. So mitigation of um, clearance for a 40-inch tire, like I'm saying, is you can move that upright forward. Now, you can't just keep moving it forward indiscriminately because at some point that 40-inch that tire at lock and compression is going to start running into your core support. It's going to start running into your headlamp assembly. It's going to start running into the radiator, etc. And the vast majority of individuals purchasing long travel type stuff are not in for having to redo all of that shit and put front clips on. Now, if you look at the stuff that's on like Ryan, uh, Ryan Kib uh, page, um, we'll go into that simply because he does have uh, quite a few builds where they are basically doing this in more of a full fashion. So tearing off all of that shit, uh, et cetera, is, uh, become more of the norm for the trucks that he's building in house. And I'm just trying to find a good example real quick. And so in that case, for obvious reasons, it's going to be significantly more expensive than what you would consider the average long travel kit install. And what he is also doing is basically as much as you can until you kind of get to the point where you might as well center mount the truck. So he's kind of on that that edge, so to speak, where it, it may or may not be worth it just to center mount um, the truck. And there are some arguments in that application as well. But the point being is you can move it you know, forward. You can mitigate some of the other headaches by going with a one-piece front clip and going with a lot of other stuff. So here's a perfect example. So if you notice, uh, everything forward of this firewall, including this firewall, are not stock. So what they have done is make it clear for a 40-inch tire. I'm pretty th sure this is going to be running a 40. It would be odd if it's not over a 39. And uh, in doing so, they have... Utilize a tactic of pushing that wheelbase forward, i.e. the center point of that upright. And at the same time, like they are also running, you know, aftermarket radiators, core support in essence doesn't really exist. It's now going to transition into a one piece front clip with a substructure that's going to hold the headlights and things along those lines in the front clip. So I guess in some, you could call that the fabricated core support or the new one. But the point being is this is very far from stock. So it's not fair to take this as a comparison to um, what would be considered the norm with long travel kits and what would be considered wheelbase um, mitigation or changes. So for the vast majority of stuff that's far more bolt on, you are keeping things the same as stock. Blitzkrieg Off-Road, the infamous Nate Hansen. From uh, X Games medalist, Nate Hansen, mind you. Um, so he makes a bevy of different kits. And uh, one big difference with his stuff is they do retain far more stock uh, componentry. So here's a good example of one of his uh, all-wheel drive kits. Um, before it got trendy, it was known as four-wheel drive to younger ones. Um, and this is, uh, this is pretty um, normal 
for uh, a blitzkrieg type of setup. So he te- tends to lean a little bit more towards stuff that um, is more economical. I don't want to say cheap or whatever to apply the wrong connotation to these setups because they are still expensive to build this type of stuff and vehicle, relatively speaking. The point being is in this application, you are able to keep significantly more stock stuff. So the wheel base addition mitigation is going to be less than if you were doing something with like what Kip Tech is doing, where you're just disregarding all of the stuff, um, the stock stuff, so to speak, and just making it brand new. So with what Nate is doing, it uh, does create a situation of a little bit less investment overall because you can get away typically with like some um, fiberglass fenders as opposed to a one piece front clip. You can keep a lot of the stock stuff, front fascia, stock headlights, stock radiator. And believe it or not, that stuff adds up and that stuff could easily cost more than the actual long travel kit itself or in the shock package. So when it comes to these complete setups or installs, you do have to keep that in mind from the very beginning of your design what your wheelbase tactic or mitigation will be relative to the tire size you would like to fit and stuff in the assembly. So for obvious reasons, stuff like this has less mitigation than the others. Therefore, maybe he fits a slightly smaller tire. I don't know. I would have to ask Nate. I'm pretty sure a 37 would be totally fine on this. Maybe a 39. It might require a lot of modification with the cab and other bits, possibly the body mount. So You'd have to reference him um, and stuff like that because there's other kits that are just like this Blitzkrieg stuff that kind of mimics the more stock uh, orientation. So maybe he only moved it forward an inch or an inch and a quarter, inch and a half. Whereas on like Ryan Kip Tech deal, you can move that like two and a half inches, three inches forward and gain a lot of room for a 40 and mitigate all of that inside of a one piece front clip with all the other bits. So just to give you a little bit of a heads up on that, that's kind of like a wheelbase addition in the front end design of long travel kits and kind of what you have to look for in these applications so you don't fuck yourself as you're starting off in the process. So make sure you understand that, your client understands that if you're designing it for someone and you have all of that understood before you just start placing things indiscriminately. Now also that wheelbase addition can be beneficial in a few other ways. You can also start to add some Ackerman into the system, which can be beneficial for these shitty trucks um, because typically these stalkers have not the greatest steering to begin with. And um, it could also bite you in the ass if you add way too much Ackerman. So another tactic you could use too is if you were to remake lower arm mounts, etc., and slide the assembly entirely forward like the steering rack, etc., for all of the bits. So you're basically taking that entire like bulkhead chunk and sliding it forward in the chassis. So that's another tactic you could employ, but um, I'm sorry, deploy. But the point with that is that's now getting into a significantly higher cost incursion, and therefore that may not be viable for the vast majority of these long travel guys. So what you're kind of playing a fine line with to some degree is, can I move the upright forward enough to get the tire clearance that I want without completely butchering the fucking cab and, and hopefully not the body mount? Because the body mounts on these cabs are going to be sitting literally right fucking there on the right side of that picture. So that tire is right right going to be tagging that body mount, especially on like Silverados, etc. So the other thing you got to look for is if I'm going to fuck myself by having the steering rack location in the chassis either too far rearward and now i'm putting way too much ackerman in the system and going to oversteer the interior tire and fuck myself by not having the exterior tire steer enough and that's going to be pretty disastrous especially for street driving applications or is it going to be beneficial if i move that upright forward and get myself just a little bit more ackerman you know so these are the things you got to keep an eye out for when you're mess- messing with and manipulating the wheelbase on a long travel base setup And you need to do this literally fucking first in your design process um, and make sure that you have that understood. Now, when it comes to track width, i.e. how fucking sick boy wide this motherfucking pre-runner is, um, that, again, uh, just like a lot of things in this industry, I do have some strong opinions on that not everyone agrees with me. I think anything above, like, 94 or 96 inch range is stupid. (laughs) I just don't like it. I think you're a little bit too wide. I think basically what they are trying to do, typically speaking, when they start pushing stuff up that wide, and you guys know who you are that have done it. Um, I don't want to be offensive by any means, but it's just it's too fucking much, man. Um, I would much rather in the ballpark of being 
at like a 16 inches of well-controlled wheel travel, maybe 17 at a 94, 95, as opposed to pushing it to fucking like 98, 100, 102, just to gain like two more inches of wheel travel. In these long travel types trucks, if you're at 16 inches of usable wheel travel, you're fucking fine. I mean, it's going to work just fine. The steering rack is still going to be fucked regardless at extension. So you got to watch for that irrelevant of what you do. So if you're trying to squeeze out more wheel travel, typically speaking, you're only going to be gaining that on extension, not necessarily compression. In most situations, it's not necessarily a compression battle. So that track with addition is kind of, in my opinion, more of like a bro deal. And you're just trying to measure dicks or be cool by putting that fucker at 100 plus inches wide. Most trophy trucks are not in that range. I'll get to that in a second. Point being is you got 16 inches of usable wheel travel up front and you're and you're clapped at fucking 94 inches wide. Maybe push it to 96 to gain that extra three quarters of an inch of usable wheel travel. Maybe not. If you're at 92 inches wide and you have 18 inches of usable wheel travel in your long travel setup, you're fucking fine. Don't even stress it. You do not need to push anymore. If you cannot drive that truck properly with 18 inches of wheel travel, you've got much bigger issues. You need to learn how to drive that thing with a little bit more of a skill set orientation as opposed to just put your foot on the fucking throttle like a bro death march into the fucking berm and then destroy everything. So you're better off understanding the dynamics of the vehicle and catering to that with your driving style as opposed to I just need two more inches of travel to bro myself into some fucking sort of jump video. You know who you guys are that put those on um, YouTube, etc. cetera. Uh, that shit's not that rad, but... Uh, the point being here is track width does not need to be above 94 inches. If you're going to squeeze it, 96 is kind of like, eh, really getting there. And, uh, oh, look, that is done. So, well, in the, in the effort of double tasking, as everyone has to do um, that does own multiple businesses, etc., just put the wife in, uh, kids just went to bed so I can film my podcast and I am processing um, the new uh, Turbo R scans. So we did a bunch of uh, Polaris Turbo R scanning today for a bunch of new products for some uh, cool stuff that this client is working on, uh, specifically for the new Turbo R stuff. We do a lot of, I do a lot of design for um, UTVs, suspension chassis stuff. And Jack, uh, the other guy here at Tech, my right-hand man does a lot of stuff that's like cages, bumpers, things along those lines. So... We are very busy in that regard, but that's a little uh, side tangent. Hence, uh, why we don't have sponsors. This is our this is our own deal. But multitasking right now, processing some three D scanning we did earlier today, doing the podcast while the kids are in bed. You know, I I, I fucking did this last night. Two and a half, two two hours and forty six minutes of filming, and none of the fucking video came through. So I went to put it into the editing software, and it was just black screen with a ton of audio. So we're, we're coming back. Tonight's going to be a good night. This is going to work out, bitching. Everything's going to be fine. So um, I already went through this entire episode, believe it or not, once, and it was phenomenal. You guys totally missed it. Anyways, now let's move on to wheelbase track with stuff for uh, the tube chassis vehicles. So let's focus on the most common, biggest name, bullshit, trophy truck, 6100. Some of you may not understand what 6100 means, but that is what's considered a spec trophy truck. That is an LS3 based class. Nowadays, they are allowed to run 40 inch tires, under drive, things along those lines, but they were originally limited to 37 inch tires and a little bit smaller vehicles to some degree. But they are more or less these days identical or damn close to rear wheel drive trophy trucks with just less horsepower and torque. So the budgets to run those are relatively similar. Um, and, uh, I did an episode on trophy trucks. I also did an episode on luxury pre-runners, and I dive a lot more in depth into what would be my opinions on the definition of those two terms. So you could go check those out. Those are filmed, I don't know, two months ago roughly. Um, those are up on YouTube. So give those a, a, a quick sneak peek or go check them out. It just is long enough to give them a little dislike. You know, fuck those guys at YouTube. But uh, track with wheelbase on trophy trucks. Average trophy trucks. For a competitive trophy truck, they typically are sitting between 120 to 125 inches wheelbase. Might be infringing on 126. Might be. There, there might be a few stragglers here or there. Um, now, when I say wheelbase, just to be crystal clear, that is measured at ride height for those trucks. The reason being is that compression, wheelbase will be several inches shorter. At extension, it will be a hair more than that. So it'll be like four inches shorter at extension. 
primarily because of the rear suspension travel arc. Swings forward at extension, swings forward at compression relative to ride height. So the best way to measure that is hub center point at ride height. If you have rake in your front bulkhead, that will also change your wheelbase through suspension travel. So at compression, your wheelbase will decrease. At extension, your wheelbase will increase. And that is a characteristic of bulkhead rake. And we will get to that in depth in probably like an hour, hour and change, according to my outline. So trophy trucks, about 120 to 125, depending on who you talk to. Um, kind of like the 120 myself, although 125 is not terrible, depending on how you're setting up the truck. But moving on to uh, luxury pre runners. Extended calves typically are going to sit right around 134-inch wheelbase, maybe 136 on the stretch side, and that's fairly common with the majority of the big builders, whether you're looking at Stewart's, Geyser, um, Jimco, etc. Then you've got uh, like a crew cab luxury pre-runner. That's going to be sitting around 142, 145 range on the high side. Now, these are numbers that I typically design around. These are numbers that clients typically prefer. You will find much bigger crew cab pre-runners than that. I fucking guarantee it. You start Googling some shit, you'll see them. And, and when I refer to these numbers as ideal, what I mean is in the application of what a luxury pre-runner is essentially designed for, which is at speed pre-running for races for a trophy truck S client. In other words, like if you have a luxury pre runner race class one, we'll call that similar. If you race class 10, we'll call that similar. If you race 6,100, we'll call that similar. The point being is a luxury pre runner is designed so that you are effectively gaining seat time experience and um, going through the race course, mimicking what a race environment would be for yourself. And, uh, the following weeks. So in other words, you're pre-running a few weeks ahead of the actual race, maybe a month before the race, and you are accumulating all of the data you need for you and your co-driver so that during the race you have um, the best advantage as possible relative to your driving style and team practice. So pit stop strategy, things along those lines. So luxury pre-runner has to be able to legitimately not only enter these race courses but maintain a hefty level of speed relative to race speed. So we're not going to say that they're 100% the same because they simply aren't. Luxury pruners typically are significantly heavier, a little bit slower, things along those lines. So we'll, we'll give it like an 80 to an, a 90 percentile range of what they can maintain speed-wise relative to racing conditions. And that's pretty fucking good because these things are going to be, again, I filmed a video on this, but the point being is... If you're building a luxury pre runner that's a single cab, you're basically, in essence, building another race truck. So if you're running a trophy truck, you're going to build a luxury pre runner. It's going to be similar in that same wheelbase. If you're doing an extended cab, and typically those are three-seat platforms, like I'm saying, most of those are going to be in the 134 range. And if you're doing crew cab, I like, I like the number 142. I have done a few at 144 and 145 as well. And those seem to be good ranges to keep the chassis not only settled but also nimble enough and uh, agile in the degree that it doesn't feel too far away from the race truck while you're pre-running etc the closer you can get to mimicking that the better and um, that is always a good thing when it comes to uh, dialing in all of the race stuff for race day and your comfort level um, especially when you're driving style so those are kind of like the three gen generalities. Now, I have designed ones that are definitely longer, and you'll see that on YouTube. You see those guys doing uh, the bullshit jump deals and just stuff like that. And typically speaking, those are going to be trucks that are not technically used uh, legitimately for pre-running. Those are more like toys and fun things like in Glamis or finding sick boy jumps on Onyx Off-Road and hitting those. So, again, kind of a variance between like what I am considering a luxury pre-runner to some degree that's being or a serious pre-runner that's being utilized in its um, raw fashion as a pre-runner for a race team as opposed to like a really badass truck that's that's kind of like more on the toy side of things that you take out with your family and friends and go fuck around so two entirely different things and that's why i'm referring to when you're talking about serious pre-runners i like to stick to those wheel bases now when it comes to track whisk you're going to see those in like the you know 89 90 range to 94 maybe 95 maybe 96 some trophy trucks the majority of stuff i design is definitely 
not more than 94 when it comes to big truck stuff. Um, and I do like some of the smaller stuff too. Um, that's closer to like 89, 90. So again, it's different strokes for different folks. Um, there's a lot of opinions on that. You're going to find variance in that between builders. So if you start going across the board from like the OG SPD shit to the uh, Geyser Brothers stuff, to what is uh, ID, the old SPD stuff, to Porter, to ES, to um, moving forward to Cambridge Engineering, Mason Motorsports. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting some. There's Lumacraft, um, uh, Tisco, uh, psh, 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 Herps, Smith Fab, um, etc. But the point being is they're all going to be in that rough range. So we'll say 89 to 94 is fairly common. Um, anything outside of that, I feel like may not necessarily be competitive for the big truck stuff. Now, the smaller classes obviously are going to be different. So a 7,200 base truck will fit those class requirements a little bit lower wheelbase. And uh, class 10s and things like that are going to be um, lower wheelbase, lower track width style vehicles. So there's some variance in that as well. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of a, a quick little review on track width wheelbase um, overalls when it comes to this bullshit. So now let's, uh, let's kick back over to this. Let's go with um where is let's go back to the desktop let's get that folder open do 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 starts so let's go back to uh inclination here is inclination so hopefully you remember this from our uh discussion the other day scrub is that green line and the kpi is the red line so that's going through the bearings in the upright the blue is the center point of the tire the green line is obviously not at the bottom of the tire. It's done that way specifically because you do not want to measure at the bottom. You're going to have tire squish. Again, I reviewed this before. I'm just going real quick with that. So let's talk about how it's measured relative to the uh, upright. So when you go to purchase uprights, so if I don't want to design my own uprights and I'm going to purchase some uprights, let's go to um, Cartex sells uh, their own series of uprights. And um, they're typically more for buggy type stuff. Uh, we have designed several suspensions for them. So they're a little bit more on the economical side per se. I wouldn't say race buggy type stuff, but definitely for um, toys, maybe a very light like sand truck type application. But the point being is they sell them based on degrees and that uh, degree connotation to it. So this one right here is a 10 degree. This is a 12 degree, 12 degree. 14 degree, um, 10, 12, 14 is kind of standard, um, when they're referring to these and what they do is, uh, I can pull up the diagram one sec rear wheel drive uprights. I know I have the diagram in here. I saw it the other day. There we go. And so what they do is they have the degree of inclination towards the vehicle and the lengths of the center points. Now, they're not the only ones that do this. So if you want something that's a little bit more race car-esque or something that would be for like a trophy truck or big um, deal, there's two primary companies that you could purchase uprights from. The first being Pro-Am, Pro-Am Racing. That is a good old Roy. And he's got his, you know his own theories on inclination. And he's kind of what I would say on one side of the spectrum. And I'll get to that in a minute. And you also have ID designs on the other side spectrum. But the point being is they sell these in degrees. And that is a degree of inclination towards vehicle. And so let's say 10, 12, 14. I mean, 16 might be a standard too, depending on um, how many guys are running that 16. And uh, I, I personally don't like this. I, I think this is kind of dumb um, because I don't want you to focus on degrees. I think you should ignore that entirely. What I think you should focus on is let's pull that other one up that little green spot right there i think you should focus specifically on the scrub number and let the degrees fall wherever the fuck they want so what you're going to do is you're going to get your lower bearing in position relative to the hub and the, and the the clevis that you're using or or uh snout block that you're using and the wheel and tire package that you're using so get your wheel tire package your hub your snout block the bearing for the lower arm center point all chunked ready to, to shred on your upright design and then figure out where that green is going to be and figure out what number you want to run for that. And then that will give you the line where you can place the top of the upright. 
So if it turns out to be 14.9, excuse me, if it turns out to be 14.9, that's fucking great. I'm more concerned with that green number being where you want it relative to the degree of inclination. So some people might be like, oh, that's bullshit. They're all done by degree. Yes, I get that. But my point being is don't get stressed out about that. I just fucking ignore that. I put the scrub where I want it and then build backwards from there. So that's why I, I don't care about specific numbers on these because this is also kind of like bullshit to some degree because you have so much variance in the snout block, the fucking hub assembly itself, the wheel and tire package. You see where I'm going with this? This number here is what's the critical number. So why base it on this when there's three variables chilling in between those two to get you where you want to be on that green number? So um, let's Google and see uh, if we can find find some information on that. Um, let's, well, first, let me just show you ID Designs Uprights. I think it's .com. Is it IDDesigns.net? Let's see. So this is David. Um, and, uh, they, I mean, arguably, he makes some of the nicest um, uprights. So here you go. Um, they're expensive, but he does do them proper. So this is, I designed Trophy Truck. So this will be his own, per se. Um, for parts, let's click here. Um... He's got to, you got to upright. <laughs> you need to uh, Tisco, so he's making the uprights for Tisco. Um, and Jimco, I believe too. Jimco class one, Jimco class one hammerhead. But the uh, the point being is, you can purchase or have him make you some some really nice uh, uprights. They're a little bit uh, spendy, and and then Pro Am as well. So let's see if we can find. I know Roy does not have them on his website. I know they're sold through McKenzie's. So let's see if anything pops up. I don't think there's much on his website. But you can um, call Pro-Am, and they make uh, multiple uprights in uh, various sizing um mechanism it goes by clevis size and then upright degree and upright spread so for example like a kind of a standard class one upright from pro-am is a 5.9 clevis with a 14 degree inclination and a 14 inch spread we've had several clients use those um, over the years etc cetera, etc cetera. and like i want to say the herbs trophy trucks run those craig can um correct me on that but i want to say there's they run like a the bigger, the 6.4 clevis for like a trophy truck. And then you can, you know, you've got some different inclinations. I would think like a 16-inch spread, 16 degree is, is one that I know Roy has. And he's done others too. Um, but again, they're also sold in that fashion of uh, degree and um, uh, clevis size and then spread. And like I'm saying, I, I don't follow that uh, for the most part. I'm more concerned with what would be the scrub inclination at the bottom. But that doesn't mean that the Pro-Am stuff is incorrect or that the stuff from CarTech is incorrect or like even Dave's stuff is incorrect. It's just different strokes for different folks, you know? Um, and so everyone kind of does things their own way to some degree. And uh, as long as you come back to that, that green scrub number relative to your inclination angle, it's kind of irrelevant because we all kind of end up in the same spot um, with where we want to be, which is focusing on that scrub number um, primarily. So let's see if, uh, but yeah, I mean, they, they don't have, if Roy definitely did a spindle, let's see what it pops up there. I mean, I've got some CAD files of Roy's uh, stuff. I just don't have, I could pull those up. I don't have time for that. It doesn't matter. The point being used, you can call McKenzie's or Pro-Am, and they can uh, get you set up with what you want um, if you do want to buy uprights from them as a kit, which is the Clevis, et cetera. Everson. I think Everson might be using Pro-Am stuff. 
I mean, that looks very familiar. This uh, this may be pro am. Oh, I don't think it is pro am. He might be doing his own. So Everson again could probably make uh, make uprights for you too. Spindle upright. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure Everson could. As with a, a bunch of other companies as well. So it's not like that. There's Blitzkrieg right there. Um, Nate Hansen again. But, yeah, so just so you understand kind of what's going on in the market when you're going to look for these uprights, you're going to primarily be purchasing them based on degree and spread and then obviously the snout, snout block, or clevis um, assembly relative to your hub. But what's important is you need to understand your hub setup, your wheel and tire package, and all that to get you to that green line. And so let's, uh, let's see. Um, Our foot inclination. Approach part. Um, and then the other thing too is like on UTV based stuff, which we'll get there. I mean, we're talking about the measurement and scrub right now, but let's go through. Uh, we can we can look at um, let's see if UTV. Because UTV stuff, basically, most of the stuff is you're going to um, uh, pretty much cover like stock uprights in uh, UTV stuff. There's not much deviation from that. There are replacement stock uprights, so companies are machining better versions like ZRP, Fortin, etc. And so they're not really changing the inclination and things like that when it comes to UTV stuff. It would be odd if an individual is changing the inclination in UTV stuff, and I can show you that in a minute, but let's, let's focus back on, um, uh, uh, this is Justin from shock therapy. Let's see what he says. Uh, blah, 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 blah. So he's referring to passengers of wheels wind will offset too much. It will negatively affect the front suspension geometry and cause problems. So these are the feedback and the moment of steering. Pretty much aware of the front and the steering bits. Yeah, so what he's mentioning here is basically if you have more scrub, it is going to, well, to put it simply, it's going to cause more stress on the system, so to speak, um, to turn. And there's a cascade effect of that. Now, there's also some benefits to that to some degree. So, again, um, I'll dive into that in a second. But he is he is correct in this. Um, so the closer or lower that scrub number is to being zero, the easier it is to turn that tire on its axis. Now, to be crystal clear, this is basically all measured and theorized at uh, ride height. At compression with camber chains, etc. cetera, um, this stuff kind of changes, so we're not really focused on that. Uh, Kind of, not really, and I'll get to that in a second, too. Um, yeah, and so, like, I, I've seen this before, and I don't think he's correct in this, but uh, whatever. So he's saying sand cars are half-inch, class one's off-road, half-inch through. So, yeah, so, so he's, he, he's definitely not correct in this. Okay, moving forward. So for real wheel drive trucks, buggies, things like that. So he's talking about quarter inch to half inch of scrub and trophy trucks. Yeah, that definitely is not uh, the case. Um, there are some people that do design trophy truck uh, scrubs to be sub one inch, but there's also guys that are running um, higher than two inch and they prefer that. And that's done intentionally. Um, and so there's two uh, schools of thought per se. You can be on the higher side, you can be on the lower side. I tend to be um, in between one and two, a little bit over one, say like one and a half, one and a quarter range. I've done a bunch of stuff in that range. I have done sub one inch stuff. And to be fair, I have run some program stuff too, which tends to be a little bit on the higher side. Um, and, and I have done, you know, two, two inch plus. Now, when it comes to some of the long travel based stuff, we have um, done way more than that because sometimes you are utilizing additional scrub to mitigate issues with a short, lower I'm sorry, a shorter upper arm than you would prefer, giving you a fucked up camber curve relative to the wheel travel um, goal of that specific kit. So one tactic is to use uh, 
difference in inclination to gain some scrub and then increase the upper arm length. And I can explain that here in a minute, but let's focus on like trophy trucks, buggies. So rear wheel drive trophy trucks, I like to be um, preferably a little above one inch to inch and a half range. I would say that's where a lot of stuff is that I prefer. Now I have designed sub one inch, like I said, and I have done two inch plus. It's going to be more feedback on that side, etc. And for a front engine truck though, I don't like to be too high on that equation. It puts a lot more stress into the steering components. And some of the guys that have mid-engine trucks or rear engine trucks can get away with a little bit more scrub. Same with buggies. Like on a buggy, I feel like running a little bit more scrub is not necessarily a bad thing because you can ha get away with it with the mitigation of less weight on the front end. So there's kind of a little bit of trade-off there too. I feel like if you're too far close to one inch in a, like a front engine trophy truck, et cetera, uh, it's just not going to have enough feedback in the system um, appropriately. That's why I'm saying like I prefer to be a little bit above one inch on um, big truck stuff. Uh, and so, again, that it would be like rear-wheel drive trucks, not including long travel kits. Now, on all-wheel drive, um, oh, and then on, like, beam stuff and TTB stuff, it's a little different. So, on beam stuff, I, I usually will, depending on how the individual wants stuff set up, whether it's, like, a race beam type application or um, if it is a uh, streetable application. So, if we're going more streetable with it, I will generally be a little bit lower on scrub, so we'll stick more to that one-inch range, inch and a quarter range. Now, if it is, and, and we're, we're measuring scrub in that same diagram with the tire and wheel. Now, in some of the race beam stuff, I do like to push camber higher. So four degrees of camber at ride height, five degrees of camber at ride height. So those of you that uh, design this stuff, I you probably are understanding where I'm going with this. You intentionally push your scrub up in those applications. And you do so because at ride height, you're already kicked over. So that additional scrub actually gets uh, deteriorated, so to speak, with the contact patch being a little cattywampus relative to ride height camber. And the other mitigation uh, with a little bit more scrub too is when you're at full compression. If you have a lot of camber change at the compression side of travel and you really reduce that cptc it's not necessarily a bad thing to have a decent amount of scrub at ride height ride height to mitigate any um, unwanted effects of going of having the um, uh, scrub inverse at compression when you have a lot of camber gain at compression so you do to some degree got to watch that um I hope you understand what I'm getting at. It's basically, right, it's basically, let me pull that up just so it's a little easier to understand. So this is at ride height with basically a degree and a quarter, degree and a half of negative camber. So now imagine that um, compressing and gaining 10 degrees of camber, 9 degrees of camber. So we're doing a pretty drastic camber curve on the compression side of travel where that tire is now sitting pretty aggressive at compression. Well, think of that that little scrub measurement. If it's really low at ride height, it, it could flip and it could end up on the other side of the contact patch. So one way to mitigate that on the compression side is by simply adding in some scrub at ride height. So you might be pushing the two-inch range to mitigate some of that at the compression side because you have to remember at speed and compression, that's a lot of force that's, that's implanted into that front end. Um... And so you're, in theory, at, like, mega fucking traction and input, um, depending on the situation. But the point being is you can use uh, the scrub and, and, and mitigate some other bits in the suspension system by manipulating that scrub in sort of this uh, reference range, so to speak. Um, and this is on, like, a tube chassis center mount truck, like a trophy truck, per se. Now, um, if you're on a beam deal, and let's say we're fucking... We're shredding at five degrees of negative camber at ride height. Uh, this is what I'm referring to, just so we're clear. It's this green thing. Um, uh, if we go to five degrees, we um, might want to open the scrub up a little bit too, as opposed to a, tr a beam truck that would be a little bit more ideal at one to two degrees uh, negative at ride height. 
And again, that's done because you're going to have extreme camber gain at compression and you want to avoid uh, having that uh, scrub inverse at compression um, or inverse too much at compression relative to the contact patch, so to speak. And this is in reference of a straight line. So obviously through turn, that changes because the tire would then be more upright through turn, especially if you're referring to the exterior tire at camber gain. So I hope this is not getting too confusing because um, this is just a lot of cool shit uh, to go through. And uh, again, this applies uh, primarily to the rear wheel drive uh, truck scenario with a lot of camber gain. Buggies, it's very similar, although you have to keep in mind buggies have significantly less weight on the front end. They are typically mid or rear engine. So inherently speaking, like I was saying, I do prefer to run a little bit more scrub in the buggy situation. And let's say if you were doing a rear wheel drive mid engine truck, similar characteristics with um, uh, being able to add a little bit more scrub and not having uh, the same type of effect as it would in a front engine vehicle. Or let me put it this way, the same type of feeling for the driver as it would in a front engine vehicle, simply by default of weight distribution relative to um, feel of, of, uh, the, uh, of the driver. So now that's going to cover for the most part, um, the bullshit with rear wheel drive. Now let's go into real quick. I did mention like the long travel based, uh, stuff, uh, and adding uh, scrub appropriately. Let's see if, uh, find a good shot of, uh, Nate steel. So here's a, a good example of this. And um, I don't want anyone to take this the wrong way, uh, especially, Nate, if you watch this for, for some reason. I know you're pseudo-checked out, which uh, is totally fine. But um, you are, in essence, wanting to um, control the camber curve as best you can, and you can't really change the chassis pivots. So you're forced to manipulate items like the scrub to bring the upright a little bit more uh, straight up. So in um, this diagram, you're moving this point right here closer to the tire. So we're gaining a little bit more um, of the upper arm length without changing the chassis widths. And so in doing so, you're going to increase that scrub. So I have seen some truck stuff, etc., run up to like four inches of scrub. And again... In a perfect world, no, that's not ideal. But in the long travel world, that's not that's not horrible. That would be something that would be considered a trade-off. And in gaining the extra few inches of travel, especially at the extension side, and I will go more in detail in this when we go to our camber curve section, which is coming up next. When you want to make sure you have the appropriate travel and the camber curves, inc increasing that scrub some, like I'm saying, up to like four inches is sometimes required to get this to be viable. Now, there are uh, long travel manufacturers, et cetera, that have mitigated that headache by simply removing the upper arm mounts off the chassis, lengthening the upper arm by mounting the upper arm now on top of the chassis, and then getting their camber curve relative to this new location that they have created. It gets a lot more fluid and smooth, like Ryan Kiptek does that. Mizzou has been doing that for a long time. Um, and then you can now bring your scrub back down and mitigate the camber curve. So again, it's all about trade-offs. So in the situation of not being able to move that upper arm pivot in a long travel base setup, don't be afraid to push that scrub up some to get you some bitchin' camber curves. In my opinion and in other people's opinions that do design successfully long travel base stuff, that is a factor that you can manipulate without too many disastrous effects down the road, no pun intended, um, now you don't want to be at like six inches of scrub or get way the fuck out there. That's gnarly. But if you're at three and change and you're stressing it, I wouldn't, that would be acceptable for long travel kits, barring the fact that the inverse would cause significantly more problems for the kit. So I hope you can understand where I'm going with not ideal, but trade-offs have to happen when you consider long travel design. And this is one of the trade-offs that you fight while mitigating camber curve fuckery. We'll get to the camera curves in, in a second. So let's go to all-wheel drive trucks with um, some of the inclination tidbits that I like, etc. Because I, you know, like I was saying on the rear-wheel drive stuff, I um, prefer 
uh, like my personal truck is probably gonna be right around inch and a quarter, inch and a half range. I have done sub one inch and I have done two inch range and two inch plus, uh, depending on client's request, etc. And we'll dive into more of uh, that. But let's go all wheel drive upright section. And so all wheel drive uprights, again, there's a lot of opinions on this stuff. Um, it's hard to tell. Here's a good uh, picture to some degree. Uh, but when you're dealing with all wheel drive, so you're going to have a CV in there that has to have a range of motion and it has to uh, apply torque and power through the assembly to get you moving forward. Now, there is a center point of rotation of that CV. I prefer to have that center point on the inclination angle or as close as you can. And what this does is it mitigates CV walkout. What that means is as the CV is further away from inclination, whether it is inboard or outboard of it, the CV, as the, as the upright rotates, what happens is the center point in the CV tends to walk side to side a little bit, and that walking effect will, will actually add to plunge and not in a good way. And you may have to try and mitigate that plunge through other characteristics, et cetera. Whereas you can line up, if you can with the parameters you're given, line up appropriately the CV center point on the upright. You're going to minimize that walkout and you're going to effectively help you get to a better plunge number for the system. Now you want to be able to do that in combination with running, in my opinion, a relatively low scrub number. I like to see one inch on this type of stuff, just like on UTV applications. I definitely like to see under one inch or what we call sub one inch scrub radius. Um, and the reason for that is several factors. Um, one of the things is like torque steer. Torque steer starts to bite its, you know, rear its ugly head pretty quick in um, these applications. And it's arguably one of the worst fucking things in the UTVs. Hence why people have been trying to mitigate torque steer. And you can't really mitigate torque steer in the UTVs without effectively either designing an entirely new suspension system with brand new uprights, which I can show you that in a second, or you're going to be, nah, you, can't, you pretty much have to do that. You're going to have to, you have to design a new system and uprights. I just don't see how you'd be able to do it with stock, uh, stock componentry. Um, at least that I know of off the shelf stock stuck. Um, but to be fair, like I primarily stick to Can-Am Polaris, uh, some Honda stuff, uh, Textron stuff. And, um, what else am I forgetting? I don't really touch a lot of Yamaha. I don't really touch a lot of Kawasaki stuff. So point being is when it comes to inclination on these guys, I like to be sub one inch of scrub and I like to have the CV on center points um, for those factors. I do not like to be zero to be clear. I like to have a little bit in there um, to get, uh, I just you know want to avoid like two inches of scrub in, in these where like you can get away with that in other applications. Um, Camera change with scrub change. I kind of already reviewed that. You know, obviously, that can be a dick when you start to have that uh, severe camera change. So let's go back to show you exactly what I was referring to with the UTV-based um, bits. So, tech consulting. I'll just show you my, uh, my personal car I designed um, for myself. It's, we're going to have to go back a little ways. And on that one, you know, we did um, custom uprights and uh, all new suspension, etc. Like here's uh, one of the uprights right here for my uh, my personal UTV build. Kind of a a Pro Four esque variant for you uh, for a UTV. Let me just find. I gotta find some suspension picks so you can see what I am referring to and you can understand what I am getting at. I like to be more visual or as as best I can. Um, oh, here's the rear suspension. We're not, we don't want to focus on that. We want to focus on the front. Let's get to the front. Here's the front suspension. So, uh, with this, I can manipulate my inclination. I can pick my arm stuff. Now this, this does have a stock chassis location of a turbo S four seat car, but I did manipulate these other bits so I can then take that, put the scrub where I want I can put the CV center point um, through there. I can minimize walkout. So I can do uh, some of these cool things in that inclination for this all-wheel drive setup, which you can't really do with the stock stuff um, in UTVs, unfortunately. So 
again, sometimes you have to uh, get into that to be able to appropriately uh, mitigate some of these headaches. Um, and there's there's some other uh, more complex things, but I think that's a good rundown of inclination and scrub and where I kind of like to, to, to put stuff. So to recap and review, uh, rear-wheel drive trucks, I like to be inch and a quarter, inch and a half range personally. Although I have seen stuff that is sub one inch that is successful. I have seen stuff that's two inch and change that is successful as well. For buggies, um, I have no problem going a little bit more for buggies. So going closer to the two inch range for buggies, I don't see that being a problem or rear engine trucks. Um, for sand cars and sand trucks, you could totally be sub one inch. Um, for the most part, those things kind of float. And, and also at the same time, you could be like two inch. Um, and two and change on a sand car, and I don't think that's an issue. If you're like four and change, eh, that's that's not great. You should probably uh, look into that. For long travel setups, again, it would not be – well, for all-wheel drive stuff, I want to be sub one inch. So I want to be a little bit under that one-inch stuff um, for a scrub. And that would be like all-wheel drive race trucks and UTVs is what I would classify under that uh, same thing. And obviously, if you're working on UTV stuff around the stock upright, well, you're fucked anyways. You got to stick to that. So good luck. Um, now for, um, where was I going with that? Anyways, uh, for stuff that would be, uh, considered like long travel, um, in, uh, the stock location, like I said, mitigation of some of the other characteristics, like the camber curve mitigation. And I'll get to that in a second. You can easily increase the scrub and, and help mitigate that. And again, someone might chew my fucking head off for saying that, but there's a quite a few long travel manufacturers that do that and they work just fine. Now, granted, if you are going to be redoing the upper arm location and lengthening the upper arm, well, then of course you can now bring your scrub back to somewhere that you prefer. But if you're at four inches and you're using stock pivots in the chassis, and that's as good as you can get with your camber curve and travel that you want, I wouldn't sweat it. I would let it ride, but it's not ideal. It's just without changing other stuff, you have to have give and take. So let's go into um, camber curves and a little discussion on that. There's a trophy truck set up. Um, go into this. Start. So let's uh, discuss this stuff. So we're discussing the camber curve. And what that is, is what you see right here. The top would be compression. The middle is ride height. And the bottom is extension. And uh, these are two different trucks. One is a trophy truck, a T4, on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is a front end I designed for Ross King of King shocks to uh, his specifications. And he did have his own specifications. I mean, just like a lot of guys that we work with, they're – um, especially the more experienced guys. I mean, they know what they want. So they're like telling us, hey, I want this camera curve, this caster curve. I want these other characteristics, whether it's certain specifics with Ackerman, certain specifics with rake, inconsistent caster, things along those lines. Um, so on this, on the left-hand side, that's a T4. And this one, as you can see, it does have camber gain at compression. I would consider this relatively normal or mild camber gain at compression. Now, I also have uh, camber gain at extension. The key here is it does not go positive. You definitely do not want positive, although there is an argument for that in some situations, and I will get to that slowly. But uh, let's dive into, yeah, before we go into some of the shit talk on that stuff, let's go with some general terms in the camber curve. So what you're looking for is, is as smooth of a curve as you can get it in the fact that you don't want it to be bouncing around with stuff. So from ride height to compression, it should just be a smooth curve up to where you have it. Now from ride height to extension, it might jog a hair. Like this one, it actually does straighten up a hair and then start to come negative a little more. That is mitigation of CPTC on the extension side of travel. Again, there is definitely some debate in designers as to whether or not that's even fucking worth it. Um, some guys think that is uh, very important. Some don't. Totally depends. The extension side is definitely more of a heated debate than it would be on the compression side. Almost every single truck that you see that's designed that would be considered competitive has 
CPTC mitigation built into the compression side of the camber curve. That's the red lines that you're seeing here. That is the measurement of the contact patch track width change through travel. And by default, with having a camber increase at compression, you are inherently mitigating CPTC. And so you're making sure that that change in track width at compression is minimized or you're decreasing the amount of change. You may not ever get it to zero, but having that a relatively small number is not a bad thing. At least that's my opinion. Some do share that opinion. Others kind of degaff it, to be fair. Now, this one is relatively mellow. Like I was saying, there are certainly more extreme variants of this with a lot more camber at compression. I mean, I've seen stuff up to like 12 degrees at compression. Um, I want to say this one is seven or eight. Somewhere in that range. Uh, I think the Ross King one was seven. I think the T4 one is eight. I'd have to check. I did, I've drawn so much fucking stuff. I have to, I have to go back to my notes on those. I will circle back, as they would say at the White House press conference. We'll circle back on that one. But the point being is I want you to understand the trends that we are about to start discussing. And with CPTC mitigation, the compression side, that's going to be that uh, increase. Now, the way I set stuff up these days and the way we're doing stuff at Tech for Clients, if they have a specific camera curve, what we're basically doing is creating a sketch where I dictate through the wheel travel where I want the camera curve to be. And then we uh, input our lower arm positioning, our upright inclination, and uh, height of the upright. And then for the most part, the computer will spit out where the upper arm uh, pivot optimization will be. This is kind of the lazy way. We have designed like our own pseudo programs inside of SolidWorks to do this for us now so that it does save us a lot of time. But I'm gonna give you a quick rundown of the old fashioned way. Now, let's see if I can zoom in. Ooh, I can zoom in. So let's, let's view the old fashioned way. Like on this truck um, right here, um, and you can kind of see how how uh, a little bit steep of the upright is. This one is a sub one inch, uh, uh, in, I'm sorry, sub one inch scrub on this bad boy. It's like seven eighths, I want to say. It's right in that range. And it's measured right about in this range. So you have some squish in there. But the point being is, so we get our lower arm in place. You understand your track width. You understand your hub, your wheel mount surface, et cetera. You, you mock in your upright with your point up here, your point down here. You mock in your lower arm. A good way and a starting point is what I call the five degree rule. You're going to take five degrees between these two arms and bring it down. So five degrees pointing down to the, to the chassis. So in other words, the spread of these right here is always going to be more than the spread of these right here. If they're not, you're probably going to have a bad day, or you'll see that through the cycle pretty quickly. Um, but the point being is go five degrees down and, and kind of draw a line there, you know, and then take uh, this arm, whatever uh, angle you have this point to this point, and you have like a 90 degree line coming up, add five degrees to that. And where those two lines intersect, so you have like a line coming here and a line coming down, and pop the point there. And this is like a good way to start by hand, so to speak, of like a reference. Now, I'm not saying that's going to be where you end up. I'm just saying that's a good starting point if you're not doing it how we're doing it, which is the inverse direction. So to be crystal clear, the way we do it now at Tech Consulting is we dictate our camber curve in our program that we have designed in SolidWorks. And I will go more in depth in this when we get to the steering section, which might be like next episode. Then the computer will then tell us the optimized point for the upper arm. Obviously, not everyone can do that. We get that. What I'm saying here is if you're kind of just roughing this out in the computer for your first time, use the five degree rule to start. It's a great generalization to get you in the rough ballpark to get started. And what that is, is you have the, the upright here and you have your lower arm here. You're going to take this point in this lower arm and you're going to basically come down five degrees and draw a line. So it's going to be, it's going to come this way in the chassis. And then you're going to have uh, this line right here between these two points. You're going to draw it at 90 degrees and then you're going to kick it inboard five degrees and draw another line. And that'll give you some point right in this range. It usually always ends up in this range to some degree, no pun intended. And that's a good starting point. And then you can start cycling your suspension from compression 
ride height, etc. Now, ride heights, I like to see a degree to a degree and a half, maybe two degrees on the high side of negative camber at ride height for trucks in this fashion. Just to be crystal clear, I'm not referring to beams. So with trophy trucks and uh, some like class one buggies, I like to see between one and two. We have had clients request other numbers and we set them up accordingly, whether that's like a half degree at ride height or like 2.5 at ride height. Now, when it comes to beams, I do like things a little different. I do like to be one to two degrees if it's like a street beam, but I, I rarely like to cater to that. I mean, you're talking about like a street street queen, so to speak. For more of like the race truck stuff with beams, I like to push that fucker up to four or five degrees of negative camber at ride height. I feel like getting that excessive camber gain at compression gives you some really phenomenal bite. Again, that's how I feel. That's my opinion. I do know other guys that do build beam stuff do prefer it that way as well because I've talked to a bunch. I also know other guys that do not prefer that in beam trucks as well. So to each their own. But for these trucks, these ARM trucks, etc., I do like to see, we'll call it between a, a one to two degrees of negative camber at ride height. And there's some debate in there, but that's a good generalization for the vast majority of competitive trucks. Um, now, at compression, like I'm saying, I have seen guys that, that add five. Now, adding would be on top of what ride height is. So just so that we're understanding, if I am one at ride height and I say add five at compression, that means we're going to six degrees at full compression. The top part. So I have seen stuff that's like add five, add six, seven. I've seen stuff that's like add nine. So they're pushing like fucking 11. They're pushing 10, 11, or 12 at full compression. I have designed stuff like that. We have had guys request stuff like that. For the most part, I would say like the mellow side would be seven, eight degrees. I mean, I'd say it's kind of normal um, to some degree or some aspect. I would say that's not unusual for compression side. Again, there's going to be some debate in that. I prefer to be closer to like 10 myself, um, 10, 11. If I was uh, going to build my own truck, I do understand not everyone will agree with that to each their own. Now, here's the, the bottom side, and um, we can talk that. But again, I'm just trying to get you some generalities on like how to start with like the five degree rule and, uh, and what I was saying with ride height. I just want to make sure we're going in order. So real driver stuff. Okay, cool. And then at compression here, sometimes you can keep it like really straight. So basically you don't want to go positive. That's what you want to avoid. So let's say I'm at a degree and a half at ride height. And as I come down, that degree and a half is going to minimize, minimize a little bit, a little bit, typically speaking, depending on your um, geometry setup. So he may he may come down to like, you know, 0.9 of a degree, 0.8 of a degree, 0.7 of a degree, something like that. But it never goes positive. It never goes to zero. And then he might just stay there all the way to full extension. In the case that you're seeing on screen, that full extension actually comes back to negative like three. And that's called CPTC mitigation at extension. Again, there's a lot of debate in that. And I'll go into more detail on that in a second. But my point being is, even though your ride height's like a degree or degree and a half, you don't want to let it go positive at extension. Going positive at extension is not a good thing for multiple reasons, um, especially CPTC. But, uh, let, yeah, let's go into, so, like, all-wheel drive, race truck type stuff. Um, okay, cool. So, for those trucks, uh, like an all-wheel drive, I tend to avoid having any negative come into play at extension. And the reason for that is uh, CV articulation at extension becomes kind of like the um, important factor, so to speak. So if you were to add negative camber at extension on an all-wheel drive, you are going to start fighting that CV angle, especially at steering lock, um, pretty rapidly. And that could lead to losing an inch, an inch or two of wheel travel that you could have had. So I believe... On the all-wheel drive setups, you definitely want it to go from uh, your ride height at like a degree, degree and a half, and just kind of come to zero at uh, full extension, or like 0.5 would be a cool metric to shoot for. 
So if I'm at a degree and a half at ride height on all-wheel drive, I'm going to shoot for like 0.5 at extension, and then I'm definitely going to have at least five degrees of gain at uh, compression because on an all-wheel drive, that gain at the compression side actually alleviates CV issues. So it, it acts as a positive. And when set up correctly, so to speak, and as you're cycling it, you will also notice that those sort of parameters I just gave you, those generalizations, will help with plunge as well, which is a very important factor in the front of um, the all-wheel drive setups. So now let's go into the fuckery of positive camber um, because, uh, like I said, there is debate in that. KOH. Like KOH racing. It's ultra four racing. So, uh, UTVs do this. In fact, um, uh, Craig posted a perfect picture of this to mock it the other day. So, here is the... <laughs> Uh, the pro R. Okay. I brought this up uh, on the other um, episode as well. So what you see here is positive caster. This is not what you want. This is not rad. So they're basically doing this in an effort to gain some wheel travel because they are alleviating the CV angle at extension. For obvious reasons, if that tire were to be straight up and down, the CV angle would be, my guess, probably four degrees worse, five degrees worse. You know, between like three and a half or four and a half degrees worse. So they're intentionally adding in three, four, maybe five degrees of positive caster at extension to get them like maybe two inches more wheel travel um, uh, and alleviate that CV angle to gain that. And this is literally a fucking marketing trick because it makes the fucking vehicle slower. I don't know why they do this other than they now it can claim the travel numbers. And the reason I, I really dislike this is called the climbing effect, or at least I've been told it's the climbing effect, so I've been using that for fucking a decade now. And what that refers to is on these all-wheel drives, when you have too much extension travel and you're going through rough stuff, it starts to droop too much into the valleys, so to speak, of the whoops, and then it has to expend too much energy and forward momentum to then crawl, climb itself up out over the next whoop. So... Dirty little secret, typically we see these cars get faster when we take out some extension travel of the front end and the rear end too, and that's slightly different for the rear end. But for the front ends especially, you start pulling out some of that wheel travel and you will find that it'll get faster through the rough stuff because you're diminishing what's considered that climbing effect. You're mitigating the energy and um, forward momentum loss of what that creates. And they do it because they want the wheel travel for marketing purposes, not performance purposes. So let's not get confused. This is not a good thing. This is a very bad thing, so to speak. And I do not design a, uh, the positive, asp positive camber into setups like they do intentionally. With that being said, like I, it's not my flavor, but the guys in the KOH form of rock racing, they... To some degree, we'll have this. I mean, um, this is definitely looking a little positive on his camber. And uh, I don't mean to shit on these guys by any mean. There's a lot of qualified and uh, very smart guys that are designing and building these KOH vehicles. Um, I have done some. I just can't disclose who I have worked with for that. They have us under NDA for tech consulting. But the point being is it – and I have – let me be crystal clear. I have designed stuff for clients that have it in there. If I'm designing my own stuff, I take it out. And the reason for that is we can gain, like I'm saying, if I get even a fucking degree of positive camber or push it to two degrees of positive camber at full extension, dude, I can gain like an inch and a half of extra wheel travel. And on these cars, if you've ever been around this type of stuff, you will notice quickly that an inch and a half of usable wheel travel is kind of a big deal. So this goes back to some drivers, engineers, do feel the trade-off of that positive camber addition is going to be fine because they're gaining an inch or an inch and a half, maybe two inches of usable wheel travel in a system that is already struggling. So let's say it's 16 and a half, like on the front of this Ultra 4 car, but now we can go to 18 and 18.2. Well, there is a valid argument that, fuck it, just go some positive camber at that extension real quick. 
valid argument. And so like I've designed that into systems t- for that exact reason. I'm just saying that if I'm designing like an all wheel drive trophy truck, we're definitely not doing that. And some of the ultra four stuff I've done or rock buggy stuff that I've done, we're, we're not doing that. I'm not a fan of that, so to speak, but again, different strokes for different folks. And there's definitely a rhyme and reason as to why these guys are intentionally putting that into some of these vehicles. Let me see if I can find another one. Because there's definitely several builders that have that positive uh, camber aspect. I mean, this is hard to tell, but yeah, that's that's got some positive to it as well. Um, so it's not an unusual uh, thing. Th- this does some, it's a, that's a Can-Am though, so that's not technically what I am referring to. And, and again, this is on independent front suspension stuff, not what would be considered the um, uh, solid axle stuff. It doesn't operate that same for obvious reasons. Uh, the other thing, too, is it's also not bad to have that camber gain as well in the Ultra 4 um, stuff. Not everyone does it, but uh, to each their own. Oh, well. So at least you understand what I'm referring to with that and why there are guys doing that and why the UTV manufacturers do that, like our boys at uh, Polaris intentionally doing this. It's it's. Let's be crystal clear. It's a fucking marketing gimmick. That's all it is. It decreases performance, and it's a marketing gimmick. And anyone that tells you otherwise is completely full of shit and has no understanding of how these vehicles operate at speed and especially how the transition of weight and energy is moved into the vehicle actually moving forward. So point being, you can minimize this is always a good day. If you're doing it intentionally in some of the KOH stuff, again, not the end of the world, but it's done intentionally for a reason, and that typically is a sacrifice to gain you a little bit more usable wheel travel if you're already struggling, so to speak. So that, in a nutshell, is some of those. Now, when it comes to sand car buggies, et cetera, um, I, uh, to some degree, do... Um, prefer i don't know i've done them a few different ways so some of the guys who've designed sand car buggy stuff they kind of go super mellow with it to where there's like barely any camber gain at compression and they keep it basically flat at extension again if you've got positive uh camber at any point in time in a buggy like that's pretty much wrong there's no reason to have it in sand car shit there just really isn't um and at the same time i've also designed some buggy stuff that has some decent camber game, um, like seven, eight degrees of camber at compression too. So different strokes for different folks. Um, the sand car stuff you typically can, or typically you can get away with a little bit more lax, um, aspects to it. So you don't have to be as concerned or it just, from my observation, it seems like the builders themselves are not as concerned with the sort of performance aspect of it now there are definitely some sand cars that are designed with the performance aspect in mind so they take into account a lot of what like what we're reviewing tonight um but to be frank a lot of sand car guys don't they're kind of just fucking winging it so yeah long travel kits uh this is where we start to get into some of the most extreme bullshit and that is because we're really playing that fine line of pushing um wheel travel in the system to its max constraint and in doing so the upper arm is only so long and that fucker just kicks over and just rakes the shit out of that uh that camber curve so you start seeing fucking 12 degrees 13 degrees 15 degrees on some of these long travel kits that start to push it and the guys know who who you know is kind of uh known for that like i know kip tech is definitely known for that um etc etc um Anyone that is running, uh, let's just see. Oh, let's see what comes up. Long travel. I mean, I know this is Yahoo, but let's see if we can find anything. Uh, beam stuff comes up. Here's some arm stuff. But the point being is on the long travel truck based type of stuff. Um, what ends up happening is that shorter upper arm can kick really bad in the, the travel cycle and get you a lot more uh, gain than you would want. A lot more gain up here. Well, not necessarily than you want because, again, some of them work really well too. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just inherent with having a much shorter upper arm on long travel-based stuff. 
And then typically because that arm is shorter, you almost inherently will get a negative at extension. What you don't want is positive uh, camber through travel. Again, you still want to avoid that um, even in the all-wheel drive uh, setups. Now, there again, there's people that might argue it's okay to have a degree or two in like a Silverado all-wheel drive uh, kit. Um, I don't think you ne it's necessary because I've seen guys accomplish decent amounts of wheel travel in the four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive type setups like Ford Raptors and things like that that are getting a usable 16 to 18 inches of wheel travel under 94-inch track width. Um, and I think that is totally viable, and that's what you want to shoot for. And in those situations, we're not seeing positive um, uh, camber at extension or at all in the travel, so to speak. Now, if you're a rear-wheel drive setup, you can definitely allow it to go negative camber at extension um, as well. And so that you want to avoid in the all-wheel drive stuff, like I was saying, even for the long travel kits, because if you start infringing on negative at extension, you're just decreasing wheel travel intentionally because you're now finding or you're now getting to the maximum angle of the CV usage quicker. So by keeping that tire, again, you know, straight as it can be without going to zero at the extension side for a four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive long travel kit, you're going to basically maximize your wheel travel performance in the characteristics of the suspension and not like fuck you on the CV as well. And like I said, there's a lot of trucks designed that way that work just fine. You do not need to have that positive aspect to the extension side in those trucks. Someone's probably going to argue me and tell me that's horseshit, but whatever. Again, just my opinion. And I have designed stuff that's outside of my opinion to be perfectly fair. Different strokes for different folks. So, um, uh, yeah, I went through the, the, you know, I touched on the climb effect with the all wheel drives for those images, of the front end, um, blah, 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 uh, torque steer. I did mention that before that has to do more with, uh, some of the inclination and some of these all wheel drive, uh, type setups, um, CBTC. So yeah, so let's go back to that. So this red line is CBTC contact patch track with change. And uh, this is something I believe that a lot of builders overlook or don't understand properly. So inherently speaking, like I was saying before, any truck that has camber addition at compression, which is almost any truck that you're going to see that's even remotely competitive, is already mitigating it to some degree. How much mitigation you apply is a preference of builder, a preference of engineer, and um, driver. So that contact patch at ride height is going to decrease in size at compression and decrease at extension because inherently the flow is like that. So in these situations, the mitigation factor is going to be manipulating the camber curve. And this is true for both all wheel drive and rear wheel drive applications. So to mitigate that effect at compression, you can start rolling your, you can start increasing the camber gain. So the more camber gain you have, the less contact patch track with change you're going to end up with. Like I was saying, I have designed stuff up to like 12, and I think I've even gone above 12 degrees, even maybe even closer to 15 degrees at full compression, um, et cetera, for you know, different client specifications. And when you start getting up there, you start minimizing this contact patch track with change a lot more, especially on the compression side. The argument primarily with CBTC typically revolves around the compression side of travel, not necessarily the extension side. Although I have done setups and I do like to have a little bit of mitigation on the extension side, hence why you're seeing on this screen two or three degrees of negative camber at extension. That is also helping mitigate that contact patch track with change on the extension side. Now, to be fair, like I said, the argument can be made that's fucking pointless, and I get that too. And the, the argument for that as to why it's pointless is because on the extension side, the truck is more or less floating. So there's not a lot of force that is being brought into the system, so to speak, with the interaction of the tire and the ground. Now, that is the complete inverse on the compression side. So when you talk CPTC, Typically speaking, it's more important to revolve around the compression side of that conversation. And mitigating it on the compression side is where you're going to see the more positive results of CPTC mitigation 
through wheel travel as opposed to the extension side. The other thing too is on the camber curve on the extension side, as you can see in this diagram, if you try to mitigate this too much by having too much negative camber, you're going to start decreasing wheel travel because you're going to over center the upright and the arm location or max out that bearing too soon. So in a situation, if you're really trying to minimize contact patch track with change, CPTC, on the extension side of travel and you get way too fucking greedy with it, you're going to find yourself losing two, three, maybe four inches of extension travel that could be very valuable for you in this environment. So on the flip side, you can also keep that tire a little bit more straight up at the extension side and now you can gain a little bit more. So there's some mitigation of CPTC characteristics relative to your camber curve and your wheel travel. So you are basically going to fight all three of those at the same time. Now, again, there are definitely designers and individuals, and you know who you are, who don't even apply any of CPTC thought or process into the equation. They just fucking let it ride. The argument could also be made that that's probably fine as long as their camera curves are in sort of these generic areas because they're already kind of mitigating it just by being there. But I have had clients literally show up and say, hey, on the compression side of travel, I want X number of CPTC max or I have a range of CPTC from this number to this number. This is what I want to maintain. On the extension side, I don't give a fuck. Happens all the time. Or on the extension side, I want a little bit of mitigation. And so... That's what you're seeing here. Some mitigation on the extension side, and I would say mild mitigation on the compression side, as opposed to far more extreme mitigation, which would be a significantly higher camber addition on the compression side. So hopefully you guys understand that. Um, oh, and so the basic concept from that, or the easiest way to understand what we're doing here is to think of it like, like you're pushing dirt out of the way. When you have a lot of contact patch track with change in the front end, at ride height to compression, it's almost like you are pushing the dirt. You know, you see what I'm saying? So when you come, when you're at compression and you're coming back to ride height, you know, you, you have this, the truck is, you know, coming back to sort of its neutral position. It's like pushing the dirt out of the way because through travel, that distance is changing. So if you minimize that, the theory is that's less distance to change, less to push to the side, and less of a characteristic that only adds to forward momentum reduction, if that makes sense, because it's expending energy and force to push material out of the way. This is the concept. I don't know if anyone has legitimately measured that. But I do know that the individuals who prefer to mitigate CPTC the most swear by it. Um, I do not claim to be a professional. I've said this many times. I do not claim to be a professional driver or be able to tell you that, um, you know, mild to extreme CPTC mitigation is going to make me faster in the dirt. Unfortunately, that's, that's out of my, you know, ass dino experience. But there definitely are drivers that can explain this to you in a fashion of, uh, I do prefer it or I don't care. And I, I, I even venture that the majority of guys driving don't even fucking know what this is. Like they, they, you, you ask them about CBTC or contact patch track with change. They're like, what? I have heard guys refer to it as scrub, etc. And like, I, I hate that. I, I don't think that's correct. I like using the term scrub for the inclination relationship. Not this. I think it gets, it gets guys confusing. Uh, confused on, on this stuff. And uh, I would like to to not confuse our, our clients or individuals that are um, dealing with us or focused on uh, these vehicles, etc. So there you go. That is CPTC mitigation and uh, some of the aspects. So we're, um, I think we're doing just fine. Let's see how far are we in. Hour and a half range. Um, not terrible, guys. And we still have like a, a shitload um, more to go. So now let's talk some caster stuff. As I hope you remember, caster is this right here. The top pivot of the upright is further rearward in the chassis than the lower pivot of the upright. So let's talk some um, 
basics. So I'm going to be referring to this now exclusively at ride height only. I will dive into the differences past that, but let's just focus on caster at ride height and some generalizations. For the most part, when it comes to like long travel trucks, uh, big trucks, etc., my observations with racers, builders, and engineers is that most are going to be between 8 degrees on the low side and 12 degrees on the high side. I would also include buggies in the mix in that too. And there is sort of this range that I would say that seems to be the preference for uh, quite a few different drivers and things like that. Someone's probably going to argue me that that's bullshit, X, Y, Z, or you have to have one number or the other. Again, like I'm saying, um, it's very difficult for me to pinpoint because I've seen trucks win that have higher caster. I've seen trucks win that are a little bit lower on the caster range. We've got uh, guys that um, love having their caster set up at eight degrees and they feel the trucks work bitching. They love how it feels. And maybe we set them up with more like 12 or 10 and they're not thrilled. We've have had situations where an individual had a truck that was at 10 degrees and they had us redesign uprights and upper arms to bring them down to eight degrees. And I have also done the inverse, you know, going from eight degrees to 10, 10 to 12, etc. or, and in between, like I've done nine, I've had guys do nine, I've had guys do 11. Um, so again, it's different strokes for different folks, but I would say that's a good range that would be considered like competitive trucks are going to be in. Um, and same with like long travel kits and things like that. Now, again, I am specifically referencing ride height. The other thing too is I feel like in the buggy scenario, you can get away with a little bit more caster um, simply because there's a lot less weight on the front end than say like a front engine trophy truck um, or a long travel truck per se. Uh, the more caster you have in the system um, can definitely end up being a little bit more stressful on the steering components, et cetera, especially in the rack applications. Now, in steering swinger setups, again, um, there's definitely some debate in this too, but I do feel like having a little bit more caster with steering swingers in a properly designed steering box ram setup is a little bit more favoring in the robustness category, you know, a little bit better for longevity. And I feel like I would be a little bit less stressed on um, components uh, breaking with a higher caster number. Again, that is simply my opinion. And I have designed higher caster number applications with steering racks with as, as well. So to be perfectly transparent in that it's kind of all over the place with stuff that I've designed inside of this sort of window relative to different, um, individuals, builders, uh, engineers and racers preferences. So that would be overall, um, with buggy type stuff. Uh, it's kind of a fucking mess too. Um, I'm not, I'm sorry, not buggy, but UTV type stuff. It's kind of a mess. Buggies. Like I was saying, I, I do prefer to be a little higher than some of the truck stuff. Um, I feel like I can get away with that with, uh, without having too much issue in, in uh, robustness. Um, but in UTVs, it's a little different. And, uh, primarily because UTVs, almost all of them have inconsistent caster. So now let's dive into consistent vis versus inconsistent caster. Um, and I want to show you what that would look like real quick or as best we can. Um, let me see if I can, uh, let's go to Google. I know ES still does it. So consistent versus inconsistent caster is another great argument amongst designers, builders, things like that. Consistent is, hold on one sec. Let me just uh, see if I can find what, uh, what I'm referring to. You know what? I think, let's go to Instagram. I think they had something on their Instagram. Yes, did. Yes, Motorsports. I do like ES Motorsport stuff. They recently sold, but um, they have a lot of cool stuff. I've always I've been a fan of their style for um, a long time. 
But anyways, uh, so there's would be an example of inconsistent. I'm trying to find a good example to show you. Here's one. Okay. So inconsistent caster is where caster changes through travel. And it's going to have caster gain at compression and caster reduction at extension. Let me just check my notes real quick, make sure I'm not going out of order. Cool. So what that means is you have your lower arm and your upper arm. And the upper arm is raked relative to the lower arm. Relative to the lower arm. That's important to understand because we're not talking about actual rake yet. So this upper arm is at a steeper angle in the chassis relative to the lower arm. What that creates is camber gain at compression. Some guys really like this. Uh, another term would be like anti-dive. I like to use the term inconsistent caster because I feel like that's easier to explain to clients. You have consistent or inconsistent. When you have consistent caster, the um, bulkhead itself is, is flat to each other. The arms are parallel. So the caster doesn't change through the suspension cycle. It stays the same. So if I set it up at 10 degrees of caster at ride height with consistent caster, she's going to move 10 degrees through travel. That's just how it moves. If I'm doing inconsistent caster, and let's say I do three degrees of gain for inconsistent caster, I set it up at nine degrees at ride height. It's going to put me at 12 degrees at full compression. And most likely the extension side is going to be in that three degree reduction. They're normally not even because you have variations in the, the travel relative to ride height, uh, compression extension. But the point being is, if I'm doing inconsistent, I'm gaining. And if I'm doing consistent, it stays the same. And so you build this variance of the degree from the upper arm to the lower arm into the chassis. And you do so intentionally to either have that or not have that. So in bulkhead rake, um, well, I'm going to go show you. Some uh, flat ones. Here we go. So these are flat, looking straight from the side. This arm is parallel to this arm. This arm is parallel to this arm. This arm is parallel to this arm. I would say we design more consistent caster bulkheads than we do inconsistent caster bulkheads. I do like inconsistent caster. I do have clients that like inconsistent caster, but I feel like the vast majority do not like it and do not understand it. Hence why I feel like there are far more bulkheads in the direction of consistent caster than there are inconsistent caster. To be fair, I also feel like both of those can win races, so I don't think it's like an exclusive thing that one wins over the other almost every time. Um, now, uh, I'm going to start building a luxury pre-runner for myself, and in that one, I am going to be running consistent caster, 10 degrees of caster, um, in a uh, actually this bulkhead is what I will be using, which is a four degree rake, consistent caster swing set bulkhead. But in that truck, I'm running 10 degrees of caster at ride height and through travel, and I'm going to be running it consistent. So uh, we did an all wheel drive uh, trophy truck for the Towers family where we did inconsistent caster on that. I don't want to disclose the specific amount of gain in that, but let's just say a few degrees range. You're not going to be gaining like 10 degrees. And you typically don't do inconsistent caster only to gain like a half degree. You know, that would be kind of pointless in my opinion. And on UTVs, they're going to be gaining like a fuckload. You know, UTVs run that inconsistent caster pretty gnarly. Like they'll gain five degrees on some of the, uh, the OEM models at compression. And then obviously at extension, they're borderline going to fucking zero caster. Uh, so that is... Um, not necessarily uncommon. So I would say a few degrees of gain would be normal for the guys that do prefer inconsistent uh, caster in that equation. Now the relationship to rake. So rake is the lower arm relationship to the chassis. Now the top is zero. This is four degrees. Like I mentioned, this is eight degrees. So like in this setup right here, to gain my 10 degrees of caster, this uh, rake, so to speak, has four degrees into it. And then the upright is leaning at six degrees relative to the lower arm to give me a full 10 degrees. So in those, we I kind of refer to it as you got six in the upright, four in the arm for a total of 10. If there is zero um, rake to the bulkhead, then 
what ends up happening is all of the caster is in the relationship of the upright to the lower arm. Now on the bottom here, this is an eight degree bulkhead rake and we have eight degrees of caster. This is uh, was done, Ross King specifically wanted that. So the upright itself is actually perpendicular, like perfectly 90 degrees to the lower arm in that essence, looking at it from a side profile. So the upright moves at a perfect eight degrees through cycle and that is the actual rake and the caster, again, all the same in the, in the suspension. Whether or not uh, you guys prefer these, etc., I will dive into more bits on the rake. I do, if I, you know, I do not necessarily, okay, I do like some inconsistent caster. Let me rephrase that. And, and say, if I was trying to build a full kill trophy truck, there is a high probability I will end up putting an inconsistent caster into that front end, a high probability. And I would do it where I would gain between two and three and a half degrees at compression. Um, just to give you some generalities. I do like the way that feels. I feel like there's some good characteristics both on the braking or decreasing side of speed as well as uh, some mitigation through um, some of the rough stuff as well. So that's that's my flavor, so to speak. But jumping forward, um, we're going to start discussing um, rake because that is next on our Outline and now like I just said rake here is another highly contested thing a lot of guys like to just fucking Ramble online about this bullshit I think the biggest misconception at least that we see these days and this was like a huge deal too like back with like dr Like if you don't put rake in the bulkhead, you're a fucking moron and blah blah and is that like zero rake is wrong I don't view zero rake as wrong and there's several reasons why what I mean for starters Let's just go back to the real aspect of everything off-road, there's fucking trucks that win races with zero degree of rake. Some of the best handling trucks I know of have zero degrees of rake. So just on a pure, you know, ass dino scale, saying zero degrees of rake is wrong, you're just inherently fucking wrong, <laughs> you know? We're starting to uh, get into some uh, heavily opinionated basis for, like, engineering in this bullshit, but... Like I had just said, the top one here is zero degrees of rake. The lower arm is zero to the chassis. This is a stage one plasma table friendly bulkhead that we sell on DIYoffroad.com. Actually, all three of these I saw on DIYoffroad.com, ironically enough. I just realized that. This one is at four degrees of rake. This is swing set steering. This one's at eight degrees of rake, and it runs a house steering rack, and that's relative to the chassis. Now... Morgan Clark did do a video with the legendary Dave Clark, not family related. Um, and Dave learned from Knife Frank. So from that school of thought, so to speak, the concept of rake has to do with an I-beam front end and a buggy trailing arm. And let's, let's pull one of those bad boys up so you can understand what I am referring to. Bitchin' picture. What? Fuck your couch. God damn it. What did I do? I broke the internet. The internet is broken. This is not a good picture location. It's a good picture, but not a good picture location because I'm trying to explain this and it's like right in my fucking way. I'm trying to find another one real quick. Okay, hold please. Uh, I just don't want to. Oh, come on, fuckers. Airbeam steering, VW thing, Volkswagen Beetle. Okay, well, Pacific Customs. There we go. Not bad. So, right here. This is a beam trailing on front end. This is at extension travel. At ride height, it's, it's over here. But the point being with this is when you have the suspension compress, this actually goes up and kind of away. So, it has this arc 
away, as opposed to straight up and down. It arcs away or rearward in the chassis. And so the basic concept here is if you're coming into stuff with the, the race truck, etc., and take that out, take that out, take that out, and you're going to hit, you know, a, a berm, a whoop, whatever you want to call it, or if the truck starts to come up like this a little bit and you're hitting, you're, you're coming into stuff, if it's going straight up and down, basically the tire is not mitigating any forces uh, in an appropriate way other than straight into the chassis, straight up and down. So it's perceived to be rougher on chassis input relative to forces coming into the system, so to speak. And the system I'm referring to is suspension. So when you rake it, what happens is as the suspension compresses, the entire assembly, the upright, moves, moves rearward in the chassis. The more rake you have, the more progressive or faster that movement is, so to speak. In other words, it will move further rearward. So it's helping mitigate some of that force. And, and the concept is taking some of that force out of the suspension assembly, in other words, the arms, the bearings, the components, and applying more of it into the shock system, the bypasses and the coilovers. So that is the inherent basic concept of why raking the bulkhead is a good thing for most. I personally like rake in there, and and, and also depends on the steering system too. But I like the rake in there for that. I like four degrees of rake. That seems to be like my my personal favorite. Again, that's opinion. For obvious reasons, I design stuff in all variations of this. The most I've ever designed is 10 degrees of rake in a bulkhead. And I want to say Vil Dosla's trophy truck that uh, Dave Clark did is like 12 degrees. It's a lot of rake, a lot. And so... Those are some basic numbers. Now, when and what platforms? Uh, I'm trying to think of the, the rake effect on steering. We'll, we'll deal with the rake effect on steering here in a minute. But for some examples of platforms, um, that top is a stage one bulkhead that we have used in like a 6100 truck, a 7200 truck, several luxury pruners, things like that. The cool thing with that too is it's a little bit easier to build. Everything is straight up and down. All the shock towers, all the mounts, all the tubing, everything, fixturing, tooling is all very simple and perpendicular. So when you add rake to it, it's um, raking everything. So your shocks will follow the direction of the lower arm. So if the lower arm has four degrees of rake, your entire shock package is now raked at that angle as well. Same with some of the other bits like the steering and things along those lines. They all get rake raked into the equation, no pun intended. Um, same with that bottom one at eight degrees and things like that. So the other aspect too, like when I was doing this for Ross King on the bottom, he wanted eight degrees of rake for those two issues. And I'm sorry for, for that issue. I just reserved, uh, that issue I just spoke about. And the other issue, which is, um, basically giving some ground clearance to the front of the truck, um, like an approach angle, so to speak. So if you look closely, you'll notice that pivot for the lower arm is relatively high in the chassis compared to what would be the bottom of the chassis here, the bottom of the Y-frame. So effectively, we're gaining like two inches and change of approach, you know, clearance. And that was a big deal. Ross was um, really stoked on that because... He would just remember pre-running in Baja and stuff and coming down into stuff or through stuff where he would fucking hit and scrape and that was uh it was brutal. So mitigating that with with this specific design that he wanted was one of the reasons why, on top of what I just reviewed for um, raking relative to the you know uh, impact and force accumulation in the chassis compared to the shock package, so to speak. So the more you rake it, the concept in theory is you have um, some mitigation with impacts of componentry into the chassis by throwing some more of that force into the shock package in what would be considered more of a natural progress, you know, natural way of movement from, uh, you know, impacting stuff moving forward and, and absorbing that into the chassis. Now, I'm pretty sure like Geyser runs rake and there's a bunch of others that run rake. I've seen like ID trucks with rake, et cetera. Um, I think we, we might pull some of those up. Um, 
Let's see. ID. No, no. We have to go to Instagram. Instagram. Um, just so that you can understand that, like, it's different strokes for different folks. Um, there you go. Now, that has obviously got rake in that front end. <laughs> um, and it does appear to possibly have... Some inconsistent caster. Again, uh, no surprise. Um, a lot of a lot of Dave's uh, style too. I like as well uh, with some of the stuff he does. I definitely he's got some style characteristics in uh, some of the rear suspension stuff that him and I see eye to eye on as well. Because um, they're even though these trucks all look really similar and are same, you'd be surprised the variance. Well, I mean, I'm going through some of the variances in this uh, in these applications too. So. Um, now to be inverse of that, like, uh, here's BJ's again, you can see there is some rake built into that front end and this is BJ's chassis. Obviously the purple. Um, now, so let's go to like an inverse. I think, uh, Craig has designed stuff that's flat. Let's, let's see here. There you go. That looks like a flat bulkhead or damn near close to a flat bulkhead. Um, it's a little hard to tell, but Cam Burglar Racing. Yeah, I would say that is damn near close to a flat bulkhead. So just kind of showing you some variants other than my own um, designs. There's some rake in this one, to be fair. This is a sand car. There's a little bit of rake into this. You can see it in the bulkhead right here. Yeah, this is flat. This is a flat bulkhead. Here you go. This is one of the camera trucks. So, again, um, different strokes for different folks. It doesn't mean that this is wrong and idea is correct. These are just different strokes for different folks. Different driver preferences in different directions. That's all. Yeah, so you kind of get the idea there. So those are two different sides of the spectrum. Um, and let, let's go to Vildosala. We can show you what would be more extreme because this is uh, Dave Clark in action. Now, <laughs> to be fair, they have a Mason truck now. But what I'm referring to is the two-wheel drive trucks that they built, I want to say, in 2009, 10, 11 range. There you go. That is some serious fucking rake. That's got to be like 12 degrees. It's fucking gnarly. So Vildosala, this is a really cool truck. If you ever get a chance to um, see these guys out and about, take a look at the truck. If you ever get a chance to talk to, uh, that's my fucking eye, uh, to Dave, definitely do. I mean, he's kind of a quiet guy, um, but uh, definitely talk to him. He's got a, a lot of theories and um, great ideas, I think, you know, um, and that truck was is pretty cool. He did that in I think 2009 10 range, and it was it's it's a fast truck, dude. It does not uh, it's definitely not a slouch by any means. Vildos slow racing links, but um so that's uh some variants that you can see between these builders. Now let's dive into um oh so yeah so I like to do like six degrees on sand truck stuff. And buggies, I've done a few that are six degrees of rake, to be fair. Um, i trying to think what else. I have done stuff that's three degrees of rake. Eight degrees rake is on the bottom. I've done 10 degrees of rake. I've done zero degrees of rake. My personal favorite is four degrees um, of rake. Just, just that's my personal favorite. Um, if So me building a new truck, I'm going to do four degrees. Now let's talk about rack and swingers with rake. Oh, and this is a good point too. So although this does not necessarily apply, but there is something that will bite you in the ass if you're not paying attention, and that is the introduction of inconsistent Ackerman in raked vehicles. And that is raked vehicles that have steering racks. So um, if you are not paying attention and you put a bunch of rake into a vehicle, uh, what's going to happen is the upright moves rearward in the chassis as it moves rearward you have to keep in mind that the positioning of the upright steering pivot 
in, in space relative to the interior steering pivot, which is on the rack, is going to change through travel. And so what that creates is an Ackerman that's inconsistent through travel. Now, this is primarily going to happen with rack-based trucks. Now, in theory, it can happen on swing set steering trucks, but you can dial that out in a swing set steering system. And I can review some of that when we get to the swing set steering topic, so to speak. And so when I'm doing rake stuff, my personal preference is to not put more than like three degrees, maybe four degrees max of rake in a vehicle that is running a steering rack because you start to introduce too much inconsistent Ackerman for my liking. That's why I feel like when you do a flat rake bulkhead steering rack truck, that's kind of like an ideal setup for running a steering rack. You have zero inconsistent Ackerman inter introduced into the system. Now with a steering um, uh, swinger system and some rake, like like that middle picture there, four degrees with steering swingers, you can mitigate that inconsistent Ackerman and dial that entirely out, so to speak, with your steering s swinger system by manipulating your swingers, your center leak, and the geometry in that. You can't do that with a steering rack because it only moves in a linear fashion back and forth and thus creates that limiting factor that you can't really get away with. So there's kind of a personal... Um, preference of mine that if you're not careful, you're going to accidentally introduce too much um, inconsistent Ackerman. In other words, the Ackerman changes through wheel travel and it's a problem inherent to steering rack setups or improperly designed steering swinger setups. And you can get away with it by making sure that at extension travel, you don't oversteer and get yourself into a bind scenario and vice versa at compression. And as long as you double check that stuff and watch for it, you're, you're probably going to be fine. And usually what ends up happening is you have to decrease the turning radius slightly at ride height um, to mitigate that inconsistent Ackerman. Um, sometimes you don't, but again, it's, it's another variable that you have to watch for because it can rear its ugly head as you start to rake stuff up too much. Um, so yeah, so that is... A good spot, I think, to stop because um, moving past that is going to be bump steer, toe curve, steering racks, and steering box stuff. And fuck, dude, that's like a, a solid hour and a half just in that section right there, I feel like. So as far as this goes, I feel like this is a good section that we went through. We did... Um, you know, wheelbase and track list stuff. We went through uh, inclination and scrubs, camber curves, caster, and rake in both rear-wheel drive and all-wheel drive applications. And um, we're going to dive more into some of these aspects like Ackerman and the steering stuff next next session. So hopefully you guys learned some stuff, got some key insights, or maybe you just think I'm an e even bigger moron than before, whatever. Um, for the, those who are more experienced in the design aspect, yes, I do know there are certain things I am avoiding discussing or uh, reviewing that, that we did kind of pseudo touch upon. That is done intentionally uh, to not uh, drag this out um, or to not go into too far depth in this specific section. And I'm going to cover more of this stuff. I mean, for fuck's sake, let's, let me look. I am only on... One, two, three. I am only three quarters of the way down on page four of my outline. And this is uh, like 14 pages roughly with my notes added to it. So like I said, um, for the more advanced guys, yeah, there's some stuff I haven't touched upon or I'm uh, skipping over for the time being, etc. Or I'll have more advanced discussions down the road on some of the more advanced concepts. I just want to get some, you know, information out that kind of... Um, gets everyone in like these good generalized understanding of these topics and where this stuff is realistically speaking in these sort of competitive trucks to some degree. Now, of course there's going to be stuff outside of some of the metrics that I personally prefer or stuff that I like. That's totally fine. And like you see at almost every fucking race, there are trucks that win on 
opposite sides of these spectrums. There are trucks that run that have higher caster. There are trucks that win that have lower caster. There are trucks that win that have inconsistent caster. There are trucks that win that have consistent caster. There are trucks that win that have no rake. Trucks that win that have rake. There are trucks that win that have steering boxes or steering racks. There are trucks that win with more aggressive CPTC mitigation. There are trucks that win with zero CPTC mitigation at extension and minimal at compression. So, again, all these things are factors. There are um, all-wheel drive setups that take into account torque steer. There are all-wheel drive setups where I think the people drawing it have no fucking clue what that means. Um, but the point being is I think we did a good job tonight. We're at roughly two hours um, and change, I believe. And uh, as, as always, you know, if you guys have questions, um, info at DIYoffroad.com is uh, an email I do check or jason at techconsulting.com. Um, and uh, if you guys have questions on work, things like that, or with like, you know, I sell a ton of designs on DIY Offroad. So a lot of front ends I sell on DIYoffroad.com. So if you are starting a project or want to build your own stuff, I can sell you one of my um, non-proprietary designs. Or if you want me to design something from scratch for you, we can do that too. Raise trucks on down etc cetera, etc cetera. or there is a bevy of other individuals that can design stuff for you as well we are super busy so the probability of you calling me and me drawing you a race truck tomorrow is just not going to fucking happen um i'm sorry we, we have a wait list if um there's other aspects that we don't work out for you in that situation there's fuck uh, at least a dozen other guys that are are very competent and and quite a few i could easily refer you to that could design you a race truck. Um, and uh, yeah, so with that said, uh, I appreciate your time. This is volume number two in the uh, Off-Road IFS Design mini series on my uh, personal podcast, J-E-H-C, Jason Elvis Herdcast. And as always, gentlemen, pitter-patter. <laughs>